Sir, let me first of all thank you and your deputy for presiding over the debates with the usual tact and patience. Mr. Speaker, sir, when the Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Finance presented the budget to the House, it inevitably, like any budget, contained a whole series of measures. But these measures are never decided in a haphazard way. Budget presentation is the fruit of long discussions of a many months with various stakeholders, both public and private, with the different ministries, with the NGOs, with the unions, with members of the private sector, and so on. The Minister of Finance also has to examine in detail all the economic figures. That is one of the reasons why we move the budget to November, because all the figures are then obtainable. He has to take stock of the effects of the budgetary measures taken the previous year, <coughs> and also to take into account the economic and financial situation in the country. He must also take into consideration the world economic situation and make an assessment of how it is likely to unfold. And he must do all this without losing sight of the overall vision and philosophy of the government. It is therefore a major detailed exercise, time consuming, which will have a direct impact on the economy in the coming year and give the direction to the way forward. Mr. Speaker, sir, the Vice Prime Minister, Honorable Xavier Luc Duval, was only appointed Minister of Finance last August, that is some three months ago. In spite of the short time that he has been Minister of Finance, he has clearly mastered his brief and done a remarkable job in a particularly difficult international context and I think he needs to be applauded for his achievement. Let me, Mr. Speaker, at the very outset, respond to the remarks made by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition and which was repeated ad nauseum by others. They say that I, as Prime Minister, have had full discussions with the Minister of Finance I've had three Ministers of Finance since 2005, and that some measures were introduced by the first Minister of Finance in 2005. They were removed by the second Minister of Finance in 2010, and are being reintroduced this year by the new Minister of Finance, and that I approved all three of them. Mr. Speaker, sir, any Prime Minister worth his salt is naturally consulted by his Minister of Finance on the budget proposals. I've, at least I operate this way. The Minister of Finance, after having done all the groundwork I referred to earlier, reviews the economic situation with me as Prime Minister and proposes measures to address the new situation. We have long discussions. The Prime Minister does not necessarily agree with all proposals. In fact, some of the proposals come from the Minister of Finance himself, which I find to be very good. We have long discussions, and, but at the end of the day, the Prime Minister gives his stamp of approval. This is how I proceed and I assume that responsibility. When we came to power in 2005, the economic situation of the country was alarming and deteriorating fast. In fact, when I was leader of the opposition, time and time again, we had press conferences from 2001, say, to 2005, and I rang the alarm bells. The shadow minister of finance also rang the alarm bells, warning the government that all the key macro indicators were turning to red, eventually were in the red, and were worsening but of course to no avail. Let me briefly remind those who are talking of saving the country from bankruptcy of the economic legacy we inherited 
in 2005, a public debt of nearly 70% of GDP. The leader of the opposition himself acknowledged during his speech that once public debt reaches around 60%, nearing 60%, we have to be worried. But during their mandate, public debt continued to rise year in, year out by no less than 10 billion rupees per year to reach nearly 70% of GDP when they lost the election. Let us look at growth. Honorable Nick Wong Wing spoke about low growth. 4% is low in those circumstances. Let us look at growth at the time. You were not in politics, but I don't know whether you were following. Growth had been reduced to 2.2%, Mr. Speaker, 2.2%. And let me remind them, we had left the economy growing at 10.2% in 2000. 10.2%. It was reduced to 2.2%. The tourism sector had a poverty growth rate of 2.3% under them. When I was leader of the opposition, I did ask questions to the then Minister for Tourism, Honorable Buddha, and I asked him what were the reasons for the low growth in, to, in the tourism sector. What was it? He's such an able man, he can make miracles. Why was it so low, 2.3%? And he tried to blame it on external factors. You can check the answer, you will see the answer. And I reminded him, Mr. Speaker, sir, that why is it then in all other countries, including all the islands, <laughs> they were having much, a much higher growth rate? And he had no answer because there was no justification, no possible justification for such a paltry growth rate in one of the pillars of the economy. Mr. Speaker, sir, they managed to have an unprecedented, unprecedented means there is no precedent, unprecedented negative growth in the EPZ sector, not for one year, not for two years, not for three years, but for four years running. Negative growth in the EPZ sector. 35,000 people lost their jobs when they were in power. A constantly rising unemployment rate, which peaked at 9.6%. We created twice as many jobs they created, from 4,500 to 9,400. Foreign direct investment, and I'll come to the accusations about foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment, Mr. Speaker, sir, the average FDI during their four years in office was 1.6 billion rupees only. When we took over in 2005, in one year, we had more FDI attracted to this country than what they did in four years. There were serious imbalances in our external trade. Our net international reserve was only 54 billion rupees. The latest figure I have is 111 billion rupees, more than double, and we are speaking of billions, not millions, billions, from 54 billion to 111 billion rupees net reserve. The balance of payment was in the red for two years in a row. And on top of that, they left skeletons in the cupboard, away from the side of the population, amounting to 3 billion rupees, which we had to clear, and we did clear the 3 billion rupees. All of this, Mr. Speaker, sir, believe it or not, in spite, in spite of increasing VAT by 50% in 12 months, in spite of that, increasing income tax from 25% to 30%. And let me remind the House, because some have short memories. Let me remind them of all this at a time where there was no global economic or financial crisis, even at the horizon. There was no whiff of a crisis. 
around the horizon. The price of oil was still stable. It had not yet started its virtuous rise. In 2000, the price of crude oil was 28.2 US dollars per barrel. 28.2. In 2005, when we took over, it was 53.4 US dollars per barrel and has continued to rise. Last Friday, it stood at 107.79 US dollars per barrel. Commodity prices were not rising worldwide at the time. The sugar protocol was still there. There was no reduction of the 30% in the price of sugar. And the multi-fiber agreement was not dismantled yet. No wonder, no wonder that the honorable leader of the opposition, when he was prime minister, felt the need, and I can understand him, felt the need to say in the last year in government, la situation est dramatique et sans précédent, nous sommes en état d'urgence économique. And we all know who was the Minister of Finance then. <laughs> what an admission of how they had been reckless and irresponsible in the management of the economy. And they talk of sauver le pays, these people. We took over in 2005 with this economic mess, but we did not shrink from our responsibility. We did not say, oh, we're going to leave. Let's go back to the people. No, sir. Le pays était au bord du précipice, sinon dans le précipice. Mais nous avons arrêté le déclin économique. And this, this, in spite of the fact I just mentioned, the sugar protocol was scrapped. There was a reduction of the price of sugar over four years by 36%. Rapid rise of oil and commodity prices. I just mentioned the figures. The dismantling of the multi-fiber multi -fiber agreement. In other words, we had to sustain a triple shock in the economy. At the time we took over. Imagine for one minute an economy in ruins, three external shocks to face, and all this before any global or financial crisis which started to loom in 2007 and became a full-blown economic crisis in 2008. This reversal of our misfortune in the face of such dire new economic threats did not happen by itself. Look at other countries, compare. We took bold actions. We started the necessary reforms which were long overdue. We put our finances in order, all this without raising VAT or income tax. And we brought the country out of the infernal economic decline back to the path of growth and prosperity without ever losing sight of those who were at the bottom of the ladder. We showed, Mr. Speaker, sir, that you can combine economic efficiency with social justice. It can be done, and we showed how it can be done. And believably, it is those very people who have now the audacity to say that the country is going bankrupt and they need to take over to save it. God forbid us, Mr. Speaker, sir. Coming back to the accusations of zigzag and undoing of the measures of the former Minister of Finance, let me say this, Mr. Speaker, sir. Unlike the former orator, former Minister of Finance, I will not go down to his level. At least I will try and accuse him of all the sins of the world. So I will not do this. I will assume my responsibility, Mr. Speaker, sir. But let me say, Without devolving anything, let me say, first of all, in spite of my, all my urgings to consult me early on, he took a long time. I understood this. I must say, frankly, sincerely, I understood his position. He was new. He had no grasp of economics or figures, and he wanted to have more time. I always have my economic advisor, Andrew Scott, to come here when I'm preparing the budget. At some point, he comes here to look at the measures. He came here. I asked him to go and consult the Minister of Finance. He did go. He came back to me to say there's nothing to consult. 
because they're not ready. He was working closely with his two advisors, Mr. Sherry Singh and Mr. Dorka Singh. They were the ones who were advising him how to prepare the budget. No wonder he was at a loss. Eventually, he did come to consult me. Fair enough, he did come to consult me. Now, there was no problem with the NRPT. I hear Minister, uh, Honorable Boda, former Minister of Tourism, say NRPT. I mean, Rambulam, whatever. You like my name, I know. <laughs> there was no problem. Even when we introduced it, we had said we're introducing it because there's no CADAS in Mauritius. Once this is done, it will be fairer. We will remove it. And we had taken a commitment, and I, and I totally, uh, I'm not saying that I didn't agree. We had taken a commitment prior to the election that we will put it in our manifesto because the uh, former Minister of Finance had been criticizing it and all this. There was no problem because we had already taken a decision to abolish it. So that was no problem. But I did tell him, and I hope he will agree, I did tell him at the beginning that his taxation measures were messy. I understand he was very keen to undo most of the measures of his predecessor, but I did tell him it was messy. We could not say, for example, anymore that we are the lowest taxation uh, country in the world with a tax ban of 15%. Now that we're changing all this, one tax there, one tax somewhere else, it's not giving a clear signal. That was what I meant by messy. It was muddy, probably done in good faith. I'm not questioning the good faith. Probably done in good faith, but I felt it was muddy. But he explained to me that he was convinced that this is the way we should go. People are cheating, this and that and that. I said, okay. He wanted to introduce capital gain tax and all this. And as I said, Mr. Speaker, sir, I am not shrinking from my responsibility. I eventually agreed and said, okay, we shall see how it works out. What is the final results? Now, one year later, one year later, we have to look at two parameters, Mr. Speaker. Sir. The Minister of Finance has to look at two parameters. He has to analyze the effects of the budgetary measures we have taken in the past year, see what impact they've had. And also, he has to look at the world economic situation, especially, as we know, there is an economic meltdown in the Eurozone. There is an economic downturn in the United States of America. He has to take this into consideration. Otherwise, we'll do a budget once in five years. That is the whole purpose of the exercise, this fiscal exercise. And we must not bury our heads in the sand, like some people are trying to do. It is crystal clear crystal clear that some of the measures introduced last year, I'm not saying all the measures, some of the measures introduced last year have had a negative impact. It is clear. It has spooked investors, both local and foreign. FDI has plunged dramatically by 69%. 69%. The construction industry has practically grinded to a halt. Transactions in the housing market, land acquisitions and land sale have dropped dramatically because of the capital gains tax. Mr. Speaker, sir, capital gains tax has practically stopped the RES projects in its track, practically. It has impacted negatively on the democratization process that we had embarked upon. To ensure meaningful and sustainable participation of small landowners, small landowners, somebody was talking about the middle class, small landowners, they want to participate in real estate projects. We wanted to enable them to derive the same benefits that were accruing to only the big landowners through the integrated resource scheme. That is why we introduced the real estate scheme in 2007. That is the reason. Empowerment of the middle class. And it was also in the process of the democratization of the economy. 
The development of a number of real estate schemes, Mr. Speaker, sir, with high class facilities is an undeniable opportunity to the small landowners to secure direct participation as investors, entrepreneurs, and promoters in the real estate sector. The introduction of the capital gains tax last year, unfortunately, has been discouraging small landowners to transfer their land into the RES projects against equity as they were taxed even before they were financially remunerated. No one can predict how the present economic upheaval will unfold. Neither its duration nor its depth of what we can call an economic tsunami, Mr. Speaker, a global economic tsunami. Nobody can predict. Therefore, these extremely trying and testing times in economic and financial management as amply evidenced, Mr. Speaker, amply evidenced by what is happening across the world, from Ireland to Greece, from Portugal to Spain, from Italy to France, from the United States of America, the United Kingdom, as well as Japan. We can see what is happening. Even the Chinese economy is overheating at the moment. The forecast about the global economy, the EU economy, even about the emerging giants are being downgraded. The World Bank, the IMF, the EU, the OECD are all downgrading their forecast. France, I don't know whether Honorable Le Guangui knows, we have said a growth of 4.2% this year, and we're prudently saying it because there's a crisis looming of 4% next year. Ah, scandal. It's an admission as if we are failing. <laughs> France, let me remind you, had forecast a growth rate of 1% next year. It downgraded this to 0.8% some few months ago. It has now again downgraded its growth rate to 0.5%. Germany, the strongest economy in Europe, <coughs> is now forecasting a growth rate, believe it or not, of 0.8%. Italy has downgraded its growth rate to 0.1%. Japan, after two decades of sacrifice, has forecasted a growth rate of only 0.2%. And now they say, ah, don't compare us to Europe. Don't compare us to France now. Don't compare us to UK. Kenya. Compare us to Kenya, to Botswana, <laughs> yeah. to Ghana, where they have either oil or gas or diamond or gold. That is what we need to be compared now with, with our size, far away from our markets. That is the reasoning, Mr. Speaker. That's why I speak of military economy. Clearly, there is no conception of what economics is about. Mr. Speaker, sir, and at, that, at a time like this, at a time like this, they decided to abdicate the responsibility and resign. And I was not in the country. I've never heard of this. Mr. Speaker, sir, I heard various explanations of why they're on the other side now. Honorable Jagat has been fair to say every time he asked for an appointed, I did give him. He's the Minister of Finance. But Honorable Boda came so many times to see me with bright ideas. Honorable Sudan to <laughs> tell me about his everlasting loyalty that you cannot smell the noble leader of the opposition. How many times you have told me? <laughs> huh? And Mr. Speaker, sir, we don't have to be a rocket scientist to draw conclusions because the conclusion is already the answer in the words of the former Minister of Finance. When he resigned, what did he say? 
that is staying loyal to the Prime Minister, has no problem with the Prime Minister. No problem. Right? That they're going to stay loyal on the backbenchers. They have asked the PPS to stay in place. All the ambassadors to stay in place. All the nominees to stay in place. And it was asked a question by, by a journalist, but what's going to happen now? And his answer is revealing, la clé dans la main premier ministre. What key? Mm. I know I'm the leader of the, but what, what key are we talking about? Clear, Mr. Speaker, sir. Had I, had I intervened in the inquiry, fine, they would have come back, except they had told me, except for Mrs. Anumanji, they would have come back. Mr. Speaker, sir, as I say, that was no time to abdicate your responsibility. From Ireland to Greece, from Portugal to Spain, in the UK, governments have had to introduce highly unpopular austerity budgets to redress the financial situation, to calm the markets, to allay the concern of the rating agencies as well, and to ward off the risk of default. All of them have been adopting severe and painful austerity measures, including drastic cuts in spending. And as somebody, I think, from the MMM said, when you get into that position, when you have to do drastic cuts in spending, what does it mean? Public service, the health service, these are where, the, where, the, where, where you feel the pain. And who uses them both? The poorer sections of society? They've had to re even reduce salaries, slashing of jobs, and all of them have paid a heavy political price. In Ireland, in Portugal, the governments have been voted out of power. In Greece, the Prime Minister has been shown the exit door. In Spain, only on Sunday, a new Prime Minister, Mr. Zapatero, has stepped down and a new Prime Minister has been elected. The economic and financial woes have spread to Italy. The Prime Minister had to resign. In France, Mr. Speaker, sir, in France, the Minister of Finance was announcing the budgetary measures. In the middle of it, he decided to make some changes because of the to calm the markets because there was a risk of downgrading. During the budget, he was correcting measures. And Mr. Fillon, Mr. Francois Fillon, the Prime Minister, has just announced a second raft of austerity measures in two months. Even the United States of America has been downgraded. The richest country in the world has been downgraded by the, by the rating agencies. Many, many governments, Mr. Speaker, sir, have been forced to either renege their electoral pledges or to change and to maybe change the economic and social policies within a very short span of time. Because conditions have changed dramatically. You have to adapt. You cannot just go on as you are. Mr. Papandreou, a socialist, elected to support the lower and middle classes, has had to introduce some of the most dra drastic spending cuts on welfare programs in Greece. He has laid off so many workers, hundreds of workers, thousands, I should say, of workers. He has reduced the salaries of civil servants. Pensions, look at what happened in pensions in Greece. He has raised VAT on essential goods not on any goods, on essential goods and services. He has privatized many state-owned enterprises. Never heard of from a socialist prime minister. Never heard of. Forced to do the same. Not his fault. He inherited these, those situations. Since a long time, Greece has been giving false figures and all those things. Same in Spain, Mr. Speaker, sir. From a socialist government again. Portugal, the UK, the UK has brought the worst austerity measures since World War II. Mr. Speaker, sir, it is clear that the world economic situation 
has changed dramatically. There are certain economic facts that we cannot escape from. We have no influence on them, none whatsoever, but we are subject to them. What we have to do is to be pragmatic, practical, nimble, flexible, and agile in the face of global uncertainty and adversity. That is what we have to do, and that is what we are doing, Mr. Speaker. Sir. Rather than remain inflexible and dogmatic just to score political dividends, we have put the interests of the country ahead of political partisanship. And as I say, we should not bury our heads in the sand, impervious, totally impervious to what is fast, a changing and distressing economic outlook. We have adjusted our policies, adopted new initiatives, revised our strategies to meet the changing challenges of the day. We could not persist with policies that were not delivering results, Mr. Speaker. So even if they were made in good faith, as I say, with the best intention of the world, we could not continue with them. We are, we are a small country, Mr. Speaker. Sir. We have a very open economy. Our fortune are inextricably linked to what happens in the global economy, whether we like it or not. Especially, we have a heavy dependence on the European countries. We have adopted, as I say, a pragmatic and responsive approach, determined not by political, for political reasons, determined by facts and circumstances and in the best interests of the country. As I stated earlier on, Mr. Speaker, some of the measures announced last year have been adversely affecting the confidence in the economy. I mentioned the fall, drastic fall, 69%, 69% of fall in FDI. And the low level, relatively low level of investment from the private sector. Confidence was shaken. Okay. We all know that we need investment to sustain growth, to generate gainful employment, and to broaden economic opportunities. So we could not remain insensitive, Mr. Speaker, sir, to the effects of policy measures on economic fundamentals. Are the responsible and responsive government, we will continue to monitor the economic situation. And we will adapt and adjust as and when necessary to protect the interests of the country. As I say, Mr. Speaker, sir, these are exceptional times. We need to show exceptional responsiveness to safeguard and protect the economic interests of our country, Mr. Speaker, sir. And it is abundantly clear that some of the policy changes introduced last year have created an impression of discontinuity and rupture in our economic strategy, rupture, I should say. We have restored our initial policy framework that has paid dividends, has made its proof, paid dividends between 2005 and 2010. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, let me now come to the budgetary measures. Let me refer to the lame explanation for the calamitous shrinkage of foreign direct investment from 2010 to 2011. <laughs> what is the excuse? Ah, the Prime Minister's office is blocking, was blocking some of the projects. That is the great excuse. Let me inform the House, Mr. Speaker, sir, that when it comes to taking decisions regarding prospective investors, and I say this to my ministers all the time, I have given clear instructions that a proper due diligence exercise must be done, must be undertaken first. We do not want investors with suspicious backgrounds to come to Mauritius and to soil our reputation as a clean investment destination and jurisdiction. Let me mention one such case of investors who benefited from a red carpet treatment by some let me talk about this, Mr. Chaperone, taken to dinner, big hotels. This is the group which claimed, believe it or not, they claimed they had $8 billion in cash, which they wanted to invest in the country. They asked for appointments with different people, including the Minister of Finance. He was quick, like this, to me. $8 billion in cash to invest 
My first question was, when I was told they were asking for an investment, for, for, for a meeting, my first question was, why the hell would somebody have $8 billion of cash and want to invest in Mauritius? Invest in Monaco? Invest in, why Mauritius, suddenly? And I asked for due diligence to be made. I would not give an appointment without this due diligence. You have to be, Mr. Speaker, sir, either terribly, excessively credulous or motivated by considerations that one can easily suspect to believe that some good Samaritans will bring us salvation by investing 200 billion rupees cash in our country. That is why I refused to meet them until the due diligence process was done. If it was done, fine. You cannot 100% even then, be sure. But at least you've done the process. And in doing so, Mr. Speaker, sir, let me say to you, I was told in no uncertain terms, I will not go into the detail because it's not right, but in no uncertain terms that we should keep well away from them, these so-called investors. And that is why. Yet my decision not to meet the so-called investors was decried by many well-placed individuals, as if, you know, I, missed the, I made the country miss $8 billion. Comments, comments have been made, Mr. Speaker, sir. I wasn't going to go to this because I think somebody else uh, has mentioned it, but on the financial performance of casinos. I think either out of bad faith or mental fatigue. It is good to record. First of all, I myself said this a long time back that Mauritius must be the only country where casinos are losing money. I myself and I, and I accept it. But it is good to recall that the financial mess in which the casinos find themselves today is the direct consequence of the price of the legacy of the decisions taken before we came into government between 2000 and 2005, the, the door casting Raj. Casinos started registering ever-increasing losses due to the weight of the legacy of the past and related staffing costs. Who recruited so many people in the casinos between 2000 and 2005? Who? Including of doing, doing all this and then giving a 14-month salary as well, an agreement. In 2008-2009, the losses were 16 million rupees rising to 71 million in 2009 and 2010. But under the last Minister of Finance, in 2010, 2011, these losses increased to, believe it or not, 138 million rupees, more than the combined loss of the two previous years and almost double the loss of the previous year. That is what happened. Remember the days, Mr. Speaker, sir, when some cronies were literally, literally some cronies were taking bags full of money, stashed with cash from the casinos, not to be deposited in the banks, to be handed over. <laughs> now, there have been criticism about some appointments. I agree. But, Mr. Speaker, sir, I have a responsibility too. Even when we take care, we, we know, and I, I'm the first person to agree, I say this, even when the MSM and government, I was saying it. Some of the people we have appointed, as if they become, become themselves big lords, as if they are a lord to themselves. And we have acted. We have acted upon them. But I heard the former Minister of Finance talk about the appointment at the FSC. But he has to be honest to say that I did clear this name of the person a long, long time ago. In fact, I asked him, why are you delaying? I did ask this question. As for the, for the ambassadors, Mr. Speaker, sir, to be frank, and I, and I sympathize with him, I must say. You know, when I have to take a blame, I will take a blame. I sympathize with him because I understand he's a partner in the government. When it came to embassies, he was complaining. Maybe if I was in his place, I would have done the same. Because I had told him, I can't give him UK, France, South Africa, Washington, New York, 
Even India I was telling him at one point I would rather appoint somebody else. But I can understand he was uh, feeling a bit that what he was, even China he couldn't get. So he was feeling a bit, uh, so I eventually, eventually I, I did, I must agree because I had thought of somebody in mind, but uh, I agreed, okay. I can't just be, you know, play accaparé, as he says, play just one side. I said, okay, India is a big country. We have special relations with India. Okay. And then he chose somebody who was a former ambassador. I think was candidate at some point in the election. But who was an Indian national married to a Mauritian. I did ask him the question, are we sure? Because India doesn't like to appoint Indian nationals as ambassador. He said he was sure that she, was, she had renounced the nationality. I also checked, I must say, and it looked as if she had. We forwarded the name, but what can I do? India wants to make sure. And it took a bit more time, I was a bit surprised myself, to check whether that was possible or not. Eventually they cleared it, but unfortunately they decided to resign. The time she reached there, she took her luggage down, she had to take her luggage back and come back again. In Malaysia. Huh? In Malaysia, she said. As for the Mauritius duty free, let's be fair. I, one to one, I spoke to the former Minister of Finance. I just cannot put people who I know are going, what they're going to do. They are Mr. Speaker, sir. Hmm? He, wanted, he wanted to appoint a person. I was reluctant, I agree. I was reluctant, he came back to me. You're right to say that you came back, you were feeling embarrassed yourself, you had to say the same thing. I was saying, I want to wait, I want to wait because I wanted to check other things. That I agree. Eventually, I said yes. No, eventually, I said yes. You gave me the names, I noted. Eventually, I said yes. You know what happened, Mr. Speaker, sir? I said yes. He cleared with me whether I can mention it in cabinet on Friday. I'm not talking about what happened in cabinet on Friday. Fair enough. He will remember. I called him on the very day cabinet meeting, Friday morning. And I said, I'm afraid. That name is out. Cannot be. Why, Mr. Speaker? Why would I do that with a partner? You have to be fair also. There must be a reason behind. You know what happened, Mr. Speaker, sir? I'll tell you a story you will love. He was already on the radio. I didn't know. I don't listen to radios. And saying that he has been appointed this and that. I was a bit surprised because normally you should have allowed cabinet to approve and then you talk. But anyway, he went on the radio, apparently. But because he went on the radio, Somebody else rang me because he heard the name in a hotel, who works in a hotel. I won't mention the, the name. One of the middle managers, let's say. And he said, uh, you know, I find something very strange. I said, what do you find strange? He said, you're naming this gentleman, do Mauritius duty paradise? I said, yes. He said, well, I just heard it on radio, but there's something strange here. I said, what is strange? He said he has personally contacted the hotel, invited people who are going to bid for the Mauritius duty free to come and see what that deal can be, apparently. I can allow this to happen, Mr. Speaker. No, let's be fair. That is why I did this. How can you do this? How can I allow this? No, it's true. I don't want to, I don't want to go into detail, but that is true, Mr. Speaker. Sir. Mr. Speaker, sir. It's his mega vision of duty free for Mauritius. Duty free, duty free, and duty free, Mr. Speaker, sir. It seems there's a, there's a great thing on, on whatever is free. Mr. Speaker, sir, he wanted to appoint already he's an advisor. In fact, I told him that. In fact, I said it to others as well. He wanted to appoint Mr. Dwarka Singh as chairperson of the gambling authority, Mr. Speaker, sir. How can I allow this? We know in what, in what context all this was being done. I don't want to go into the what they call illico presto actions to appoint some people in certain institutions who earn the nickname of rent collectors, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, my government is committed to set the base for high investment 
high productivity, high efficiency, and high technology, as well as a high wage economy. These are not vain words that the Honorable Minister, Vice Prime Minister, Minister of Finance spoke of. The measures announced in the budget go exactly in that direction, in the context that we are living in. To name but a few, Mr. Speaker, sir, we have made available unprecedented resources to our promotion agencies to put Mauritius on the global map and to boost our investment and take our products where demand is. We will provide for better connectivity to the region and we are ensuring that our modern airport must become a new hub in the region and it will become a new hub in the region. It will offer interconnection between Africa and the rest of the world. We will open up more economic space, divesting from some assets to redirect our efforts and improve facilities in the public. And I've said it, Mr. Speaker, we cannot go on year after year, year after year, subsidize lame ducks, Mr. Speaker, sir. It's public money. We have to take a decision. It has gone on for too long. We have announced a series of institutional reforms. They've already been listed by the Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Finance in his budget speech. Planters. Planters will save up to 287 million rupees a year through the merger of the SES fine institutions by the Ministry of Agriculture. Planters will benefit from 70% discount on premiums due for the 2011 to, to SIFB. This will reduce the cost per pound by some 3,000 rupees. The full VAT refund on agricultural machinery, equipment and tools that they purchased in 2012 will benefit some 23,000 sugarcane planters, some 6,000 horticultural producers, and some, some 5,000 animal breeders, Mr. Speaker, sir. The investment and incentives, including VAT refund in the fisheries sector, will improve the standard of living of fishermen, enhance our quality of life, improve the environment, widen the choice of consumers, and will be of great value to the tourism industry. The budget for food security has been increased. Already, I must say, perhaps some don't know, we're already self-sufficient in potatoes. We will be in garlic and onions, hopefully. But the budget has been increased to 150 million rupees, an increase of 50% increase. The Office of Public Sector Governance, set up under my office, will assist public enterprises to improve governance, because every year we see what the director of audit says, to improve governance, efficiency services, and cut out waste. This is some, not something that happens just in Mauritius. Yesterday, the former French Prime Minister was talking about waste in government, in, in, many, in many places in the, in, the, in the public institutions. We are further consolidating our financial services sector, Mr. Speaker, sir. And we will uphold and consolidate our tourism industry to the three basic policies by readopting a three-pronged strategy focused on attractiveness, visibility, and accessibility. Emerging sectors such as ICT, knowledge center, commercial mariners, industry have been catered for. And we have gone a long way to upskill our human capital and align to the needs of the nation. That is something that everybody says every year. We are, I've heard it since a long, long time. But it is crucial that we have the skills that we need and we train the people here in Mauritius or we get Mauritians who are abroad working for other countries to come here, make it attractive. That is the key to our success. Mr. Speaker, sir, I've always maintained that the long-term sustainability of the country rest upon giving opportunities for the many and ensuring the participation of the largest number of our citizens in the economy. That is why the democratization of the economy means multiplying the number of economic stakeholders. I've said it so many times. This was so distorted during the last campaign. And this is where the budget breaks new ground for SMEs. SMEs, as we know, Mr. Speaker, sir, every year, again, good intention, I'm sure, even the previous government, good intention, but they face major constraints. First of all, lack of access to finance. It's a major constraint. They lack skills. They have poor logistics. And they lack access to markets. And this budget addresses all four constraints. I must say in a bold and innovative manner. And it is the Honorable Juval's 
ideas here. Now I must say, Mr. Speaker, sir, some in the MSM, some have been campaigning, you know these kind of campaigns, quietly, in the dark, private, uh, what they call private, réunion uh, privée, comme Lugaru, that this is a budget for one community alone. I've just mentioned what the planters are getting. I've just mentioned that, but they are saying it. They are saying it in your parties. Not the MMM, the MSM, I said. No, I know. We have records, if you don't know. Order. And they could not be more wrong, Mr. Speaker. They could not be more wrong. As I said, I've listed measures that we have catered for the middle class as well. And the poor, if they don't know it, they do not just belong to one community. They are poor in all communities, Mr. Speaker, sir. And there are many reasons for poverty. You know what they're saying in this in these campaign? You feel very hurt because people are not just poor because of the style of living. It's a direct accusation on one community. It is not true. People are poor. They get into a vicious circle. It, there's not just one reason for poverty. And you cannot turn a blind eye to those who are at the bottom of the ladder. We have a moral obligation to help the poor, Mr. Speaker, sir. Unequal societies carry moral and social consequences and affects the way the economies function, Mr. Speaker, sir. And rising inequality affects social cohesion. At a time when we need unity, that is our strength, Mr. Speaker, sir. And one of the unflinching guiding principles of the Labour Party has been to lift people from the margin of the mainstreams to the mainstreams. This is precisely why in 2010 I decided to create the Ministry for Social Integration and Empowerment. And I'm glad and I'm glad I named I'm glad I named Honorable Jubal there. Because you can see his passage there and the reflection on the budget. Although he's always been a caring person, but you get to know the nitty gritty when you are in the ministry. I'm proud, Mr. Speaker, sir, that this budget rightly puts so much emphasis on the liftment of those who are most in need. And we have gone even further. The budget provides for children, for the young, for women, for those in need of medical help, for those in low cost housing, and for the elderly. Mr. Speaker, sir, lest we forget, this is at a time when powerful countries are slashing jobs, reducing wages, cutting down on social benefits, cutting down on pensions. We have granted an increase between 6.6 and 11.5 to workers in the low wage bracket. Mr. Speaker, sir, the theme for this budget is growth for the greater good. I could not understand why the former Minister of Finance was saying it, it should have not have been growth for the greater good. Growth for the few Adif. We are aiming for inclusive growth, Mr. Speaker, so I've explained it. And this will extend to our future generations. The vision of Maurice Iljurab is precisely to make Mauritius a model of sustainable development, especially in the context of small island developing states, Mr. Speaker. Sir. In July of this year, the government converted the steering committee on Maurice Iljurab into a commission which is now operating in the ages of my office in collaboration with uh, other stakeholders and other ministries as well. Let me now come to the issue of law and order. That is an issue that all prime ministers get criticized upon. I would like to state, Mr. Speaker, that since my first mandate, the protection of our citizens has been in, on top of the agenda of my government. And I suppose any prime minister. We have to put security and for the, for the law-abiding citizens of our country first, Mr. Speaker, sir. They have a right to expect that they are safe from those who may be tempted to prey upon them, their families or the wider community. My government vision is for a free, fair, but also a responsible society. And in line with the ongoing police reform program, Mr. Speaker, sir, we launched the National Policing Strategic Framework in February of 2010 which paves the way for a new management style in the police service based on six pillars. Human resource management capability, 
intelligence-led policing, community policing, achieving, achieving a human rights complaint organization, permanent strategic planning capability, and enhancing reactive capability. We are in the process, Mr. Speaker, sir, of implementing the national policing strategic framework. And we are investing heavily in the police force. Despite the difficult times and the prevailing circumstances, the police have been well resourced in recent years to be able to meet the challenges of today. The total actual expenditure on the police department was 4.8 billion rupees last year. The provisions this year is 5.6 billion rupees. Honorable Bhagwan used to say there are no, uh, sometimes there are no cars, there are no transport in the police stations. Right. We have addressed the, 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 the problem. We are changing the fleet. In spite of already starting to address the problem, we have increased the budget to 5.6 billion rupees. An amount of 6.5 billion rupees has been provided for the fiscal year of 2012, which will be an increase around 16% on, on, on this year's budget. It is also worthy to note, Mr. Speaker, sir, that reforms program that we have been doing has started to yield positive results. The overall crime rate, believe it or not, I'm saying it clearly so you can hear it, believe it or not, the crime rate has actually declined from 5.4% in 2007 to 4.1% last year. But, but as I always say, Mr. Speaker, so one crime is one crime too many. We are not the only country where there are crimes. We have to address the, 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 the problem. And despite the fact that crime statistics clearly indicate a downward trend in criminality in general, there is, I must agree, there is a public perception that the crime level is going up in the country. This is in contradiction to the evidence. Because there are some crimes which are reported, which are very eye-catching in the, in the publication of these things. In fact, statistics indicate, indicate that the reported offenses, I'm excluding contraventions because I, this is different, they have actually declined during the period 2009-2010, from 50,250 to 46,750. That is a decrease of around 7%, as I said, in this House. Major decreases have been noted also in, in almost all the offences. 16% for theft decrease. Drug offences by 5%. Homicides by 15%. Fraud and dishonesty by 8%. Assault by 25%. Embezzlement by 7%. Automobile theft by 15%. These figures speak for themselves. These are statistics. It's not me who prepared in my office. But I must say, I must say, because of some of these horrible crimes that we see, we intend to strengthen the law by making, for some of these crimes, the sanctions will be even more severe for, for these abominable crimes. In regard to the drug problem, our drug control strategy focuses on what? Enforcement, prevention, treatment, and very importantly, rehabilitation. We are determined to reduce drug supply further through a coordinated response across the law enforcement agencies. We are providing the agency, the law enforcement agencies, with the necessary tools to crack down on drug traffickers. Now, the repressive measures, if I may call them repressive, taken by the law enforcement agencies, again, are yielding positive results. The number of persons arrested in connection with drug-related offences has increased from 1,504 in 2000 to 1,899 in 2010, and 1,672, the latest figure I have up to October. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, this is because there is now more intelligence-led. We have contacts with other agencies abroad. We get them even before, when they're on the plane, we know they're on the plane already. Large quantities of illicit drugs are being seized, for instance, this year, about 3.5 kilograms of heroin, 56 kilograms of cannabis, and 15,592 tablets of Subitex were seized. Total value of 102 million. To ease the pressure on existing prisons, a new high security prison is being constructed at long last at Melrose to cater for 750 detainees, having a project value of 1.731 billion rupees, Mr. Speaker, sir. We expect it, work has already started, we expect it to be completed in April of 2013. 
emphasis is also being laid on rehabilitation of the detainees, Mr. Speaker, so because we need to enhance the, the detainee skills so that they can find employment on the return to society. Mr. Speaker, sir, since I mentioned AIDS, it is the vision of the government to have a Mauritius with no new HIV infections occur. Very difficult, but that is the target. And where people who already have HIV are sure they get the best treatment, care, and support, and respect for the human rights. We pass bills in that uh, respect uh, for, for, for people who are getting married. Under the leadership of the National AIDS Secretariat, we have had a multi-sectoral approach to tackle the problems. One of the priorities of the HIV response is to mobilize resources to prevent new infections. In this regard, government has increased every time, every year we do that, increase the budget to fight against it. An amount of 68.5 million was, has been provided for, this, for the financial year of 2011. And in this budget, we have provided 85 million rupees. Mr. Speaker, sir, I must also say that the, for another subject, the construction of a new terminal at SSO International Airport is currently, as you know, the members know, in, is in progress and is expected to be completed by September of next year. A project for the construction of a parallel taxiway is also being implemented. The construction of this taxiway will be instrumental in minimizing the runway occupancy time, thus increasing its capacity. It will also facilitate landing of aircrafts and will be able to accommodate A380 aircrafts. In addition, in the event of major disturbances at the airport, which may cause the runway to become for, for temporarily out of service, the, this parallel taxiway would be used as an emergency runway. Mr. Speaker, sir, the trade and commercial prosperity of our country depends to a large extent on the air and the sea transport sectors. That is why government will continue to invest massively in the development and modernization of the port and airport. Regarding the port sector, Mr. Speaker, sir, the government is in the process of identifying a strategic partner for the Garku Handling Corporation Limited. The objective is to transform Mauritius. Mr. Speaker, sir, just a few words on, the, on road safety, which remains a priority for the government. The Special Road Safety Management Unit operating under my office, has adopted an integrated approach in its task of coordinating all road safety activities. The main objective, Mr. Speaker, sir, is to have an effective road management team which will work on measures for the promotion of road safety. The measures being implemented include public awareness, sensitization campaigns, improvement in physical infrastructure with the construction of the new and better roads, installation of pavements, street lightning, traffic lights, underpasses, overpasses, these uh, bellish or flashing lights on the pedestrian crossing along classified roads, and installation of additional cameras to discourage speeding. The legal framework is also being revisited, and amendments to the road traffic act are being finalized for the introduction of the penalty point system under which road traffic offenders will be sanctioned, not only by fines, but also by penalty points, which may lead to disqualification of the license of a driver. Mr. Speaker, sir, let me say something about consolidation of democracy. Mauritius is highly acclaimed as the model of democracy, and I hope we continue to be acclaimed as the model in spite of differences that we have. It's very important, Mr. Speaker. Sir. On numerous occasions, I have affirmed the commitment of my government to move ahead with the proposed reform of our electoral system as enunciated in the government program 2010 2015 to consolidate democracy. I know the Honorable Leader of the Opposition is smiling because he, he doesn't believe I'm, I'm going to do it. 44 years after independence, Mr. Speaker, sir, it is really time for us to engage in a process of self-examination so that we see what we can strengthen in our demo democratic setup and to ensure that the system meets the exigencies of a modern and forward-looking nation. I met uh, Professor Carcassen, with whom we have named. I met him twice already during his short visits to Mauritius. He wants to get uh, other information. Following discussions with him, a team of experts, three eminent two more other eminent international constitutional experts, has been constituted to look at it. They are making proposals for the reform of our system. I don't know what they're going to say, Mr. I might not like it myself. I don't know. I don't know whether anybody, I don't think anybody knows. The terms of reference of the team are to make proposals for reform for our agricultural system with the objectives of stability, 
and to a need to ensure effective government, fairness, diversity, and gender balance. I'm expecting the team, they have confirmed to me that they will submit the report before the end of this year. Mr. Speaker, sir, let me now come to fraud and corruption. I would like at the very outset to reaffirm most emphatically and unequivocally the commitment and determination of the government to continue our relentless fight against fraud and corruption. We will continue to provide ICAC with all the necessary means to enhance its effectiveness and to discharge its function. I recently reminded the House that a considerable amount of energy and resources have been deployed by many members of the House, including those in the opposition, in putting in place the Prevention of Corruption Act and in making the ICAC operational. I reiterate my appeal to all members to show the same commitment in the fight against fraud and corruption and allow the ICAC to discharge its functions in all scenarios. We must bear in mind, Mr. Speaker, that the fight against corruption, again, is not the fight just of the government, it is the fight of all the citizens of this country. As we got alleged acts of corruption and money laundering, Mr. Speaker, sir, the Commission received a total of 1,399 com complaints as compared to 1,350 last year. The number of cases reported is on the increase. This to me shows a growing public confidence in the ICAC and the willingness of individuals and public institutions to report any suspected case of corrupt practices. As of date, Mr. Speaker, sir, 475 new cases, 479 new cases have been subject to preliminary investigations, well beyond the target of 450 set for the current year. A total of 79 cases have been completed and sent to the DPP. 51 cases have been lodged before court. 18 convictions have been secured. 133 cases are still pending before the intermediate court. And they have targeted even more preliminary investigations next year, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, government aims at heightening the vigilance of the public against the evil of corruption. We, are, we need to change the mindset of some people and instill a culture of integrity in the nation. Our stand and determination have triggered a general consensus in the public for increased mobilization and intolerance towards corruption. Come what may, we will remain steadfast in our commitment to root out this scourge from our society. No one, whatever his status, whatever his status should consider himself above the law and think he can get away with ill-gotten goods. When it comes to fighting fraud, corruption, and drug trafficking, we will pursue the objectives we have set and never bend the rules and never retreat, Mr. Speaker, sir. One last thing, Mr. Speaker, sir, the exclusive economic zone of the Republic of Mauritius extends, as we all know, of an area of 1.9 million square kilometers and provide Mauritius with a huge maritime zone to manage. This coastal and ocean territory holds an immense potential for the development of Mauritius and will play a vital role in the economic development of the Republic of Mauritius. Mauritius occupies a strategic position in the Indian Ocean and has the potential to play an important role in marine scientific research in this region. In March of this year, the United Nations Commission on the Limits of Continental Shelf conferred upon both Mauritius and Seychelles jurisdiction of an area of 396,000 square kilometers of extended continental shelf in the Masca and Plateau region, over which the two countries exercise sovereignty rights jointly for the purpose of exploiting the seabed resources. Mr. Speaker, sir, this was not easy. Seychelles was not too keen on it. And we, we would have had then to go to the United Nations Commission. It would have taken a long time. They would have, you know what, what, what happens when these kind of disputes. But I talked to President uh, Michel, and now this has been achieved. This is a significant achievement for both Mauritius and Seychelles, as it is the first joint submission made to the United Nations Commission by two small island states anywhere in the world. Mr. Speaker, sir, I just want to add that Mauritius continues to actively, actively defend the right of Mauritius to effectively exercise its sovereignty over the Chagas archipelago and Tromla. As honorable members know, we have initiated proceedings against the United Kingdom under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea to challenge the legality of the so-called marine protected area which the United Kingdom has purported to establish around the Chagas archipelago. The African Union, through our lobbying and the non-aligned movement, have reiterated the infringing support for the sovereignty of Mauritius over the Chagos archipelago, including Jago Garcia. The African Union Summit and the Non-Aligned Movement Ministerial Conference 
heard earlier this year have resolved to fully support other measures that may be taken by government to protect the legitimate rights of Mauritius under international law with regard to its sovereignty over the Chagas archipelago and its territorial integrity. We had to make the, the move that we made. We've had the results, but we'll continue because it's, an, it's, it's a battle that will never end until we get satisfaction. I regards Tromle, Mr. Speaker, said government looks forward to the entry into force in the near future of the agreement reached between us and France on the co-management of the island and the surrounding maritime areas. The problem is in France they need to have special laws. This agreement has been concluded without prejudice to the sovereignty of Mauritius of Tomlin, and we intend to pursue our effort for the eventual settlement of the sovereignty as early as possible. Mr. Speaker, sir, in shaping our budget, we have always pursued two aims. The first is to fo focus on the fundamentals that will guarantee the economic success of our nation in the future and to build on the foundations of our earlier economic reforms. And the second is to set policies so as to support the population and the economy through the near, near term and what are clearly, in what are clearly very difficult times. In other words, we seek to promote long-term growth, short-term support, reduce volatility. And these are sound macroeconomic principles and they are enshrined in the budget. Mr. Speaker, sir, there are many reasons why to date Mauritius has weathered the financial crisis well. A key one has been our control of public finances. As we can see in the case of Greece, Italy, insufficient attention to the level of government debt and the fiscal deficit have been at the root of their recent economic problems. You know, sometimes I hear members saying, well, you could have done this, you could have done this. You have to look at the whole picture. And we need to be able to sustain what we are doing, Mr. Speaker, sir. It is for this reason that we have successfully maintained our level of debt at 54.2% of GDP and a budget deficit of 3.8%. What is essential is growth and jobs. That is the enduring way to achieve economic success and to navigate through the current crisis. That is why this budget, Mr. Speaker, sir, has so many measures based around growth. And as the Honorable Vice Prime Minister, Minister of Finance said, not just growth, but growth for the common good. We have achieved a small increase in government expenditure, but more importantly, we have altered the balance so that more of our expenditure is on investment and more of it occurs in the short run. With the world economy slowing, we need to provide this support that is viable in the long run. Mr. Speaker, sir, further, we have taken tax measures to stimulate investment. It was essential and encourage entrepreneurship through the elimination of taxes and dividends. Mr. Speaker, sir, the modernization and development of Rodrigues figure higher than the agenda of the government. Projects like the upgrading of the airport, the port, the road infrastructure are ongoing. The laying of a submarine fiber cable to link Rodrigues to Mauritius is indeed that all the members acknowledge groundbreaking. It's a groundbreaking measure that would enhance considerably the ICT infrastructure and provide new job opportunities for the young in Rodrigues at their doorstep. We are also giving an additional boost to tourism in this sector with a decision to subsidize airfares to Rodrigues until December of next year from the National Resilience Fund. The Ministry of Rodrigues and the private parliamentary secretary are working very closely with the regional assembly for the sustainable development of the island and the well-being of all inhabitants. Monsieur le Président, nous avons présenté un budget responsable répondant aux attentes de toutes les composantes de la population et en essayant de nous protéger de la crise mondiale qui nous guette. Ce gouvernement est responsable et solidaire avec la nation. En 2005 et en 2010, la population nous a fait confiance et nous avons le devoir de continuer à honorer cet engagement que nous avons pris pour un meilleur avenir pour Zinin Maurice, pour tous. Nous ne sommes pas de ceux qui, ont met, qui, qui mettent leurs intérêts avant ceux de la nation, qui ont essayé de faire un chantage honteux pour essayer de pervertir nos institutions. À ceux qui ont la mémoire courte, je rappelle ceci, il ne faut jamais l'oublier. Nous avons en face de nous des personnes qui, quand elles étaient au pouvoir, ont fait dissoudre un organisme qui luttait contre la corruption en moins de 24 heures, en amendant la Constitution en moins de 24 heures. C'est du jamais vu dans le monde. Ça n'a été jamais vu dans le monde. 
En ce qui nous concerne, nous sommes résolument tournés vers l'avenir d'une île Maurice prospère pour tous. C'est un fait. Il n'y a pas lieu de brailler. C'est un fait. En 2015, que nous reviendrons, nous reviendrons. C'est une fausseté. Vous n'avez pas fait. Vous n'avez pas fait. Qui a fait le Tony Crime Office Mais pourquoi 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 tu as fait Pourquoi tu as fait Dis-nous pourquoi tu as fait Le leader de l'opposition, il avait voulu, il avait voulu une garantie constitutionnelle. Et puis, il a, il a fait amender la Constitution 24 heures. En ce qui nous concerne, Mister, Monsieur le Président, quand nous reviendrons vers la population pour un nouveau mandat, et je n'en doute pas, vous allez voir, raclez que je vous gagne, je vous connais, je vous connais que je vous gagne. Allez-y, 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 je vous attends, je vous attends de pied ferme, et je sais ce que je veux faire. Monsieur le vous croyez que vous croyez l'ancien Je ne sais pas s'il est encore leader ou n'est pas leader du MSM. Il croit que le ressort, nous sommes déboussolés, vous allez voir. Vous allez voir ce que le petit parti vont souffrir dans cette élection. Quand elle va venir, quand elle va venir. Mais we are, we are fearless and we do not fear them, Mr. Speaker. Sir. But have patience. They will come, they will come. It reflects our philosophy, ambition, and special consideration that we have for our less fortunate compatriots. It is a budget that will prepare the country not only to face the looming threats from the global economic turmoil, but also for the opportunities of the future. It builds on the strength of our economy and its people. It is, Mr. Speaker, sir, a responsible and prudent budget, well balanced in its approach, and it seeks to promote growth and spread prosperity. We have all along been guided by our core values of fairness and opportunities for all. Social development and solidarity have remained and will always remain at the heart of our development paradigm. These are the reasons why the budget has been widely acclaimed by all credible observers and stakeholders and the population at large, except the doomsayers. We have confidence in our country's but strength, Mr. Speaker, sir, ethnic origin or class, Each Mauritian citizen has the basic right to citizenship with dignity. My government's economic and social model will mobilize all creative energies towards the establishment of a modern, innovative, and entrepreneurial society where unity, equity, and solidarity prevail. Let me conclude, Mr. Speaker, sir, by these words of former U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, which I find particularly opposite for this occasion. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the present, stormy present. The occasion is piled with high difficulty, and we must rise to the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. Mr. Speaker, sir, no political leader can afford to let his country escape its future. The government is blazing the trail for many, many generations to come. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir.